you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them, please, to Matthew chapter 27. As we're getting, I'll just remind you also tonight, uh, we have a men's group meeting here at the church at 6.30, Mitch? 6.30. Um, I understand there's some desserts. Man, Nadine, last time, that pecan pie. Whoa. That was so good, so... I'm not sure what's in store for tonight, but it was good last time. And uh, better than that, uh, the fellowship was awesome. So I want to encourage everybody, men, not everybody, men, women, you're not welcome. Um, men, you are welcome. So we're going to hang out for just about an hour and a half, I think is about what it ends up being, and uh, just uh, enjoy some fellowship. We sit around and talk about some things, and so I want to encourage you, if you can come out for that tonight, come out. And I think you'll be blessed for that. Matthew chapter 27, <clears throat> verse 45. We've, we've been around the, uh, the theme of Easter here lately and, and what all that references. And I want to talk just a, for a few minutes about what it looked like after the resurrection. But in order to do that, let's, let's refer back just a little bit. Verse tw chapter 27, verse 45. He says, Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land, uh, under the ninth hour and about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice saying uh, Eli Eli lama sabachthani that is to say my God my God why hast thou forsaken me some of them that stood there when they heard that said uh, the man, this man calls for Elijah and straightway one of them ran and took a sponge filled it with vinegar Put, a, uh, put it on a reed and gave him to drink and the rest said let, let be let's see whether Elijah will come and save him verse 50 Jesus when he had cried again with a loud voice yielded up the ghost and behold the veil of the temple was rent or torn in two from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent or tore in two verse 52 and the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Amen. Now there's a, a wonderful picture of, you know, after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, the Bible says that there were many that were resurrected with him. Can you just imagine that for just a minute? There is Grandma. There's Grandpa, who has been, you know, passed away for a number of years, and all of a sudden you're walking down the street, and there's Grandma. wonder what that would have been like. Or someone that you knew, a dear friend that had passed away, and all of a sudden, that the, but they died with the, with the uh, understanding that they were looking for the Christ, expecting the Christ. They lived a, a life uh, they couldn't attain to as far as for heaven, but they were looking to Jesus. They were expecting Jesus, just like we've, we've seen in, in uh, the example where Abraham was, you know, Lazarus died, and a, a, a Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, and the rich man was uh, lift up his eyes in hell, and he looked across, and he recognized Abraham and looked, recognized Lazarus. Well, they were all resurrected from the dead along with Jesus. And it said... And the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. What a, I mean, what a, what a moment. Many people saw this. Many people saw people resurrect from the dead. Wouldn't that make you, like, begin to, if you were questioning some things, would that, you would think that would put that at ease, Right? In the, in, the, in the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 8, he says, Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And now in the Amplified Bible, it says it like this. Says, Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. He led a train, a train of vanquished foes, and he bestowed gifts on men. He led a train. A train of what? A train of people who were vanquished. Death had vanquished them, but he led them out of their state of death back to life as they were resurrected. Now turn over to Matthew chapter 28. I need to lay just a little bit of groundwork, and then we're going to get to where I really want to be. 
and uh, I believe this is going to help some of you. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. He says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began, to dawn towards the first day of the week came Mary Magdalene and other Mary to see the, the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment was white as snow. And for fear of them, uh, of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear ye not, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he's risen, as he uh, said, Come and see the place where the Lord lay. Now notice this, it says, He's not here, for he's risen, as he said. In other words, Jesus had repetitively said, I am going to have to, to give my life, but I will be raised from the dead, right? It says, as he said, come and see the place where the Lord, had, uh, where the Lord lay, and uh, go quickly and tell, watch this, his disciples, that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he goes before you into Galilee, there shall you see him, lo, I have told you. And they quick, departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell my brethren that they, go, that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. So he gave them a heads up as, as to what was coming. And then I'll just jump forward here in verse 16 just for a second. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had uh, appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I'm like, wow, are you kidding me? Jesus said, I'm going to give my life as a ransom for many, but I'll be raised from the dead. And then, then they See him raised from the dead. And then, but yet the Bible still says, but yet some doubted. How is that even possible? You physically can see with your eyes. But yet some doubted. And it's hard for me to even comprehend that. But I'm going to show you in just a minute that seeing really isn't the way. Look at Mark chapter 16. I want to get to John 20, but I've got to get to Mark 16 first. Mark 16, verse 4. He says, And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. Entering into the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right, clothed in a long white garment, and they were frightened. And he said unto them, Be not afraid. You say, Jesus is Nazareth, which was crucified. He's risen. But he's not here. Behold the place where he laid. They had laid him. So in other words, he's given the same account that uh, Matthew had given, but according to uh, Mark. Now look down to verse 13. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. In the Amplified Bible, it says they returned to Jerusalem and told the others, but they did not believe them either. Hard-headed people. You're not that hard-headed, are you? Verse 14, Afterward, he appeared unto the leaven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. That's one thing to not be believed by people that wasn't in your inner circle. That's a whole other thing when the, the 11 out of the 12 that was with you every, almost every minute of every day for three years. I mean, they're with you constantly. They've heard literally everything you've, you've said, every promise that you made, every claim that you made, and yet... Somebody comes and says, I have saw the Lord. And then he's chastising them here because they did not believe them. The inner circle. They did not believe when other people said that we saw the Lord. 
That has to frustrate Jesus, doesn't it? He goes on and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel unto every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned. And notice, he's talking about what's the message here. The message is you have to believe. He's chastising them for not believing. And then he says, go into all the world, preach the gospel. And he that hears the message that's being preached and believes shall be saved. And he that believes not shall be damned. So in other words, he's saying this is like the most important thing in the world. This doesn't get any, it doesn't get any bigger than this. You have to believe. And he chastised them for not believing when he had told them repetitively over and over and over and over, I'm going to be raised from the dead. And then they hear, they watched him die. They watched him be put in a tomb. And then somebody says, I saw the Lord. And they go, uh, I don't believe you. Jesus wasn't happy about this. Look at John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I'm going to start reading here with verse 11. Now Mary stood without at the tomb weeping, and she wept and stooped down and looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus was lain. And they say to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they've taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, he turned herself back, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if you have borne him, hence tell me where you've laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself, and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. She saith unto him, or Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Now notice this. We talked about this last week. She's excited when she sees that and recognizes Him. What's the first thing you want to do when you have it? When you see somebody that you love, maybe you 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 know you know just. I mean, she thought he's dead, right? But there he is. What what's your first instinct? And he goes, "Whoa! Don't touch me yet, for I've not ascended to my Father." But I'm going to ascend. I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to pay the. I'm going to with my blood. I'm going to offer before the in the holy of holies in in the in the literal heaven. I'm going to offer that blood, and it's going to be the atoning sacrifice. Don't touch me yet. But go and tell everybody what's going on that I've raised from the dead, and that I'll I'll see you soon. Essentially, was what he was saying, right? Now jump down to verse 24. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, now watch this, this is a quote, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I just would have a hard time believing it. Is that what he said? He said, I will not believe. You talk about hard and hard hearted. I will not. It's not you couldn't potentially convince me. He says, I will not believe unless I see. Now, watch this. And after eight days, or eight days later, Again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, and the doors being shut stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Now notice the way the phrasing of that particular verse reads. They want The writer here in John wants you to understand that though he didn't come in through a door, because the doors were shut. He wants you to understand that 
he just appeared in the midst of them. And he stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Now notice this. What Thomas said in secret or separate from Jesus, Jesus still knew. What should that tell you? Don't make me go there. He said unto Thomas, Reach your finger, hear your finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. So that tells me this, that faith is just another interchangeable word for believe. And unbelief is just another word for faithless. And Thomas answered and he said unto him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because you have seen, seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So where is it and why is it that doubt and unbelief come into our lives that we struggle with believing the things that God tells us? The answer is very easy and very clear. The Bible clearly tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You only can get faith by one way. He doesn't say there's many ways. He doesn't even reference sight or seeing or, or things visually happening. That's very obvious because they actually, some of them actually saw, and yet they still doubted. Believing is a choice. It's a decision. It's not an actual evidential thing. In fact about it, I would even say this, that if you need to see in order to believe, you don't actually believe anyway when you see. Right. You cannot, and I'll prove that in just a minute. I'm not just going to make that claim. I'm going to actually prove it to you in just a minute. You cannot believe when you see. Believing or to have faith is a choice. It's a decision that you just have to make. But how do you get to the place of believing and having faith in something? And in Romans chapter 10, he says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, which tells me this, that it's not just a having heard. He didn't say faith comes by having heard the word of God. If that would be the case, most of you in this room have heard the Word of God at one time or another. So therefore, you could say, I have faith. But that's not what he said. Faith comes by hearing, which gives the indication that it is a continual thing. I would submit to you that if you want faith to work in your life, you continually need to be exposed to hearing the Word of God one way or the other. And I would even go so far as to say hearing the Word of God correctly and accurately preached. Because, you know, you could mess just about anything up. I heard Brother Hagin say this a number of years ago. He said, you can take any passage of Scripture and, and twist it to be anything you want. You could come up with a suicide Scripture, he used to say. He, he, he said, you could say, uh, Judas went out and hanged himself. And then find another verse that says, uh, go and do thou likewise. And you got a suicide Scripture. So it has to be done accurately. It has to be ministered accurately. And then I would even submit that you should not believe me. You shouldn't believe Pastor Wells. You shouldn't believe uh, Pastor Jason. You shouldn't believe uh, Pastor Thomas just because they get up and stand behind a podium. That's, not a, that's, that's a recipe for deception. Not from us, not purposely. We would obviously never do that purposely. But your protection from deception is your ability to be able to read and dissect the Word of God for yourself. Amen. I do not want you dependent on me. Amen. You will be greatly limited. Amen. I want you independent from, from just, you know, feeling like I, if I don't hear it from here, then I just can't, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be able to be helped. No, you have to learn to learn for yourself as well. And hear from the Word of God. That's why we talk about reading your scriptures and your passages so that you can see for yourself. So if I get out of bounds and I come in and I've just had a bad day and I say some goofy things, you'd be able to scratch your head and say, Pastor, I don't know about that. 
or or if you happen to be somewhere else we was we was on a uh, we was on vacation sometime where was that at was that in Turks and Caicos when we went to that meeting we were out playing around the kids were little you know we were out playing in the water and at the beach and all this stuff and we're so we're going upstairs to get kind of cleaned up it was later in the evening and as we're going upstairs we heard music that we recognized it was praise and worship music and I said I, I I, I know that song. I can't remember any of the songs now, but it was stuff that we were we were hearing, you know, and singing in church. And so I was like, Debbie, they're having a meeting. I said, let's go get cleaned up. The girls were really excited about that. <laughs> so now they got to go to church on vacation, right? So we run up, we cleaned up real quick, and we said, let's go down there. Well, we went in, and it was a woman's meeting. <laughs> so it really wasn't appropriate for me to be there, but they let us come on in, you know. And I looked around the room, and I'm like, ah. There's a guy, there's a guy speaking, wasn't it? But the room was filled with primarily just women, and it was geared towards a, a woman's ministry meeting. And so we just listened, and it was like that for a little while there was some stuff that was okay. And we're like, yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. That's good. That's good preaching. And then he got to a, a place where he's talking about women that were having struggles with their husbands. And he said, uh, honey, if, you're, if your husband won't submit, won't come into the family of God, he says, don't worry about that because you've got a, God's got a Boaz coming for you. <laughs> and I went, uh, so uh, are you, are, did he, did he mean she going to leave her current husband for another Boaz? And I looked at Debbie and I says, and she goes, I, I think that's what he meant. I said, probably good for us to leave right now <laughs> you submit to that to wrong teaching and what will it do faith comes by hearing but faith for the wrong thing can come from the wrong thing too now whatever you hear is what you get just a little bit more of you know what I'm talking about what if I keep making the statements, things like, well, if it be the Lord's will, if I pray for you, you need, you need ministered, ministered to, and you need prayer, and I pray for you, and I say, well, if it be the Lord's will, what does that say to you? It say, Now, if is a conditional word. It should tell you, you should never pray a prayer like that regarding uh, unless it be a consecration for your life like Lord I, I'm, I'm, I want to find out what the will of God is and Lord if it be your will uh, you know for me to, to go down there then reveal to me show me what your will is something like that but other than that when it comes to salvation you don't have to say Lord save me if it be your will Lord heal me if it be your will because you already have his will it's already contained within his word do you think God is going to contradict her, uh, contradict himself is he going to say one thing in his word if you believe that's his word? Is he going to say one thing in his word and then say something else? Of course not. I mean, that you're talking about somebody being schizophrenic. He could tell you different things all the time. So if it be your will, you have to recognize, it, you know, what if I preach all the time about salvation? I suspect most of you would get at some point you'd get the faith to be, that that God wants you saved. If I preached about salvation every day, every Sunday you come in, it's a it's a salvation message. But you can only get saved so many times, <laughs> right? So there has to come a time where you get you hear some other things that are applicable in your life that you're dealing with. So you 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 have to ask yourself, well, why is it that so many people use that statement? You know, if it be your will. It ultimately says this one thing. It says, I don't know. I don't know what God's will is. Then why are we here? Amen. Why do you want me here? Why are, you, why are you showing up? If you submit that I don't, nobody can ever know what the will of the Lord is, nobody really knows, why are you here? Because why couldn't we just go, well... You never know what the will of the Lord is. You don't need to waste your time to come into a, a place and dedicate and then give your money to something for somebody to say, I don't know. It's a waste of your time and your money because you can do that on your own, can't you? I don't know. If it be the, the will of the Lord, he will, and if it won't, he won't. Anybody can do that. 
could it be that somebody's unsure of the integrity of God could it be unsure that they actually have that much boldness to be able to do and say and speak on, on uh, based upon what God has given us possibly could it be that they've just been hearing the wrong thing and it hasn't developed a faith mechanism in them to recognize that things that God has done for us what was the message to Thomas eight days after he had appeared to the, the 11 disciples except Thomas what was the message to Thomas believe Thomas believe you have to learn to believe you have to learn to believe when you, ha when you can't see that was Jesus' message to Thomas, was Thomas, you can't just, if you're going like, to live life like this to where you have to see something all the time and you have to, in order to, for you to believe, you've got to see it, then, then you're not going to be very blessed. Because what did he say? Blessed are those that, who have believed and yet they've not seen. So he's telling us, he's showing us, the message is you're, you're going to have to believe when you don't know how it's going to work you're going to have to believe when you don't know what, where the answer is you're going to have to believe when, when it feels like your world is coming up you know undone it's upside down you don't understand why you don't understand what you're going through you're still going to have to choose on purpose to believe because if you're constantly waiting for some evidence of something that's changing then you are in the same category as Thomas and you're not going to get commended for that You have to choose to believe that God is involved in your life and your situation and he's going to help you all the time. Whatever it is you need. The question is, is do you believe, do you really believe that? Because it was pretty obvious that for the most part the disciples really didn't believe what Jesus said. Now I'm not picking on them. They got some, he helped them. He helped them get some things figured out. But if they had believed him, did he tell them that he was going to die and be raised from the dead? He did. And yet they still was not looking. Otherwise, Thomas would have said, well, that's easy for me to believe because he said that he was going to do it. But you all, I'm kind of envious. You guys got to see him before me. But that wasn't what he said, was it? So it was pretty obvious that for the most part, they really didn't believe him when he said that he was going to be raised from the dead. What else did they not believe? Do, do you do you believe him now don't don't give me the churchy response because I know that's what you're going to do I'm talking to people on Facebook not y'all y'all are wonderful y'all awesome you never I mean you never miss it you always get it right it's those people out there do you believe do you believe Do you believe the things that God has said? I would say this, that your faith is dependent upon consistent hearing of the Word of God. I didn't say it had to come from here. It could. But consistent hearing of the accuracy of the Word of God being ministered. Faith, your faith is dependent on that and when you hear the Word of God ministered, all kinds of things, all kinds of faith, faith for all kinds of things will begin to be unraveled. Like I said, if I always preached about salvation, I'm telling you, I'm confident to say that everybody in this room at some point would be like, man, I know God loves me. I know He saved me. I know that no matter what I've done in the past, He has forgiven me, and I know that I'm born again at some point because if that's all you ever heard that's you're going to get it because faith comes by hearing but what if I never ever mention anything about God's healing ability about what he did for you with regards to that what if I never said anything about his provision that he set up for you what if I never talk about that you've never heard it and you go home and you never turn your your Christian television programs on you never listen to anybody say anything about it you never read your Bible all you ever hear is me talk about salvation do you believe that faith would come for healing people have talked about said well I don't believe that healing stuff I don't believe that healing stuff is for today uh, well you are a case in point 
of what I just said. You don't believe it because you've not heard it. You're not listening. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. In order for that faith to come for that, you, you'll have to hear that more and more and more, and then faith will come. It'd be like hearing things like Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What if I told you that he's the same yesterday and today and forever? In other words, it doesn't matter what, what you're facing, the challenges. If you could find that he did something about something yesterday, would you believe that he could do it today as well? Could you believe that it could be forever? That's what the Bible says. John 14, verse 12, watch this now. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me. Now notice what, what word he's talking. He's using here. What? I say unto you, he that believes. What do you have to do in order to be qualified and categorized as a believer? It's really hard, isn't it? This is like deep theology here. In order to be a believer... You have to do what? Believe. You have to believe. He says, He that believes on me, the works. Jesus said this. This is not Phil saying this. Jesus said this. He that believes on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Do you believe that? Then why are you not doing that? Facebook people. Don't be too hard on them. Okay. You know, I believe in prayer. Amen. However, in this particular place, he didn't say to, to pray. He said, what? Ask. There's a difference bet between being in prayer and asking. I mean, because we, at least in the church world, we've got this connotation of what prayer looks like. And prayer in the church world really, for the most part, looks like begging and pleading. Oh, God, please, please, please help me do the Please, please. That is not the connotation that he gives us in uh, whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that shall I do. Ask is different in, in, than that in, as far as the way that in, in, you know the way that he's describing this, he wants you to see that there is a an expectation behind the ask. Prayer sometimes, can, and I, our prayer folks don't do it, but prayer can just basically be a big worry session, where people come in and they just they're so concerned about everything and they're just praying, but yet they're begging and pleading and hoping and wishing and and I just oh God if I could just say it loud enough if I could say it long enough if I could get enough people involved then, then maybe we can move you but that's not really what moves God is it so he tells us ask James 1 says, says it like this if any of you lack wisdom let him beg and plead and just yield, you know, spend hours of your time in prayer and, and, and be the most contrite. And is that what it says? He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask what? Okay, now let me stop there just a minute. Let him ask in faith. So what does that look like? If he says, let him ask in faith, what does faith mean? It means belief. So you could literally, and you won't hurt the scripture a bit to say, let him ask, believing that what he's asking is coming to pass. So in other words, he already knows the outcome. You're asking for wisdom, and God says, yes, I will give you wisdom, but ask, knowing I will give you wisdom. So if you ask for wisdom, most of the time people go, man, I need some wisdom in this matter. God, please help me. I, if I don't get wisdom, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how. That's, that is not what he's talking about here in James 1.5. He says, let him ask in faith, meaning this. 
when I ask you God for wisdom I know you're going to grant me wisdom I know that I know I'm going to get the wisdom that I need let him ask in faith nothing wavering for he that wavers is of a is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord a double minded man is unstable in all his ways I'd even say this that worry is an enemy of your faith when you start getting worried about everything and wondering how everything's going to work I don't know where the answer is coming from I don't know how this is going to work and I just, I'm just so worried about things I'm just a worrier by nature no you've just yielded to that you've just chosen to allow yourself to become a worrier you can get to the place to where you believe God you can do it it is within you to have the ability to believe God you are capable of that you just have to choose that you'll believe what he says about your situation you can believe faith can come for things like healing things like that God will heal anyone because you might be thinking of yourself and thinking I'm not worthy I've not done How, you remember Malchus he was a servant of the high priest and they were coming to arrest Jesus and Peter being the very aggressive man that he was pulls out his sword and whacks off Malchus's ear by the way he wasn't going for his ear if I wanted to cut Mar uh, Marco's ear off wouldn't you say Marco stand real still because I might hit you right between the eyes I'm going to cut your ear off and I don't want to I, but I don't want to cut you you know in, in the head here so I go he starts swinging and just happens he's trying to kill him and just happens the guy you know zigged he just didn't zag enough and boom hits his ear and his ear goes off now Jesus could have said you don't you downright dirty scumbag you trying to arrest me and take me and crucify me how dare you that's exactly what you get this is the kind of stuff that people that oppose me this is what happens to you you get your ears cut off right it could he could have said that but what did he do I mean he picked up old bloody you know messed up ear sticks it on his head and, and all of a sudden he's healed if he'll heal Malchus the guy that was trying to kill him what would he do for somebody that loves him God will heal anybody Roman, the Roman centurion he's not a Jew the Roman centurion comes on behalf of his servant and comes in what does he do he says well you don't even need to come to my house but just speak the word and, uh, and I know he'll be healed because I know something about authority I say to this one go and he goes this one come and he comes and, and all you have to do is speak the word and I know he'll be made whole and Jesus just goes man oh man I mean I'm paraphrasing but he goes wow I love this he goes man I've not seen such great faith no not in all of Israel this is awesome he only uses the word great faith two times and this is one of them and then there is a Canaanite lady that comes on behalf of her daughter who's grievously vexed with the devil and and you know and he, he she says well uh, you know he says well I've not come but sent to the house of Israel and she goes uh, uh, but I'm not given to uh, I can't give the the children of bread the, the children's bread to the dogs she says yes master but even the dogs eat from the crumbs that fall from the master's table and he's like oh, man, you can almost see him yeah, because you kind of understand Jesus is a person. He's got emotions like me and you. You can imagine Jesus going, oh, this. Great is your faith. You, you actually believe that I will do this. Good on you. Go check your daughter out and you see that she's healed. So she's not a Jew. So if Jesus will heal people that are trying to kill him, if he'll heal people that weren't of the Jewish roots, then why won't he heal you? What's the component that might be missing, Facebook people? You, Facebook people, might need more faith like all these people in here right can you believe 
that God is a provider for your needs? If you never hear about Jesus being a provider, then you'll never have faith for it. Some hear about him, he'll save me, but he won't heal me. And then they might say, well, I believe that he might, he, he'll, he'll heal me and save me, but I, I just don't, he don't want me to have any of that nasty money. He don't want me to have anything, my, have my needs met. He wants me to be broke. He wants me to be, you know, in a house that doesn't, ain't able to take care of my needs. He doesn't want me to have a car that I can get around in. He doesn't want me to have anything to bless my kids and my grandkids with. He doesn't want me to have anything that's nice. I can't ever go out to dinner because, after all, that's what the Lord wants. But where are you getting your information from that is creating faith that he doesn't want you blessed? Because that's what's happening. Faith comes by what? And if you hear enough of that, faith comes for no provision. But what if you could hear things like that my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? What, what if you heard some of that? What if you heard other examples like in the Old Testament in 1 Kings chapter 17 where there was a lady that was literally on her last meal and Elijah said, uh, if you'll go and make the cake for me first, then you'll have enough for you and your son and then watch the, the barrel of meal never run dry and the cruise of oil never fail. What if you saw examples like that, that you saw that God actually wants to provide for your need and wants to be a blessing to you? What if you saw that he told a lady to go find and borrow as many vessels as she could that were empty? Now, she might have thought, why in the world are you telling me to get empty vessels? I need full vessels. Not empty vessels, full. But what did she do? She said, yes, Lord. Yes, sir. She what? Okay, help me now. She believed what the prophet of God said to do. She believed that if she would go get the empty vessels and she would just follow after what he told her, that something would change. Did it change? It did. It comes down to, do you believe? Now, there was a moment that Thomas did not believe and he was confronted with his faithless statement of except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my fingers into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side I will not believe he was confronted with that faithless those faithless words to reconcile that to an encounter with Jesus eight days after he had presented himself to the disciples do you think Jesus would have preferred that Thomas said Lord I'm so excited I've been waiting on you you said you'd be raised from the dead I, I'm ex I was expecting you at any time but it didn't happen it didn't happen and this guy walked with him every single day now watch this Jesus told him he said you believe because you have seen Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says now faith or believe let's interchange the word just for a moment I'm teaching you this morning now faith, or now believe, is the substance of things hoped for. He says faith is something to where it creates, it's the substance of what it is that you're looking forward to seeing change or come. The evidence of things what? Come on, Facebook people talk louder. The evidence of things what? Not seen. Not seen. Thank you very much for your interaction. So if faith is something I can't see, what would you say if I can see it? Faith. Then it's not faith. It's not belief, right? Does that make any sense? If I can see it, I don't need faith for that. 
if I can see it, it's already in front of me. I don't have to believe it. I have to believe when I don't see, when I don't know how, when I don't know why, when I don't know how it's going to work out, when I don't know what has to happen in order for something to change. That's what I have to believe, and I cannot believe means I cannot be moved from that. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Meaning, no matter what it is that I'm struggling, what I'm going through in life, and I can find the scripture for it. I say, wait just a minute. He's a provider. He's a healer. He's a saver. He's a deliverer. Whatever it is that I'm dealing with, whatever struggle and problems that I'm facing, he's with me. He won't leave me. He said he'd never forsake me. And so if he said that, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to choose. Choose to believe him. Even when I can't see how. Even when I don't know how it's going to work. Even when I'm confused even when I'm challenged, even when I'm in pain. I'm going to choose to believe. That's what he's talking about here. And then he goes on and he puts the cherry on the top when he says, but without faith, but without believing, it is impossible to please him. He says, you cannot please God if you don't believe him that does not mean that you can't believe God for salvation and him be still disappointed in the fact that you don't believe him in another area you can you can be saved if you can believe that God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead uh, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You can believe in salvation and never get anything else and still be saved. But be basically living a life of defeat. Because your, your, your reward for believing that is after this life. You can still have that. But I submit to you that there is more. Every place that you can find that Jesus set the example. Jesus is God incarnate in the flesh. If you ever want to know what the will of God is, are you going to call God and say, I need a conversation, Let's. what is your will? If you want to know what's in my will, watch now. Now, me and Debbie can know, and I could share it if I wanted to share it. But you know when my will actually gets exposed? When old dad is no longer here. When I'm gone, they read my will and say, this is my will beyond me. Jesus, God said, my will is in the life of Jesus Everything that Jesus does, everything Jesus accomplished is all wrapped up in the victory for me and you. If I want to know what God thinks about salvation, then I look at the life of Jesus and I go, what did Jesus do about that? What did he say? Things like, well, I'm not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want to know what Jesus, what God thought about uh, healing people. I look at Jesus and I go, what did Jesus do about it? Did he say, well, this just is, you know, not really available at this particular time right now. But one day in the sweet by and by, when you go to heaven, everything is going to be available for you then. But you just hold on. I mean, it'll be hard. It'll be a struggle through life. Just hold on and hang on until the end. Did God say things like, well, in, you know, in your life, you're never going to have anything in life. And don't think just because, you know, that you got in the family of God that you could expect that somehow or another that I'm actually going to bless you. That I'm actually going to have enough to where you can get, provide for you, where you'd have enough to meet your need. That'd be a terrible testimony that if your need was met. You're supposed to be broke and down desolate and have nothing and just basically just barely survive in life. Show me the scripture for that. And you, you might have a chance at winning me. In fact about it, he says even in the book of Deuteronomy that in Deuteronomy 8, 18 
that it's he that gives us the ability to get wealth so that we can do what? Come on. Establish his covenant. So he says, I'm going to bless you with finances so that you have enough to help support the preaching of the gospel so that we can establish the covenant of God. So what are you going to base your life? What does your belief, where does it, what stimulates your belief? What you find here is what you can put your faith on. Now, this last, one last thing, but know this. It has to be a decision. Because if you're waiting for the evidence, then you're not going to need any faith then. If you need evidence, when it happens, you say, well, I'm believing God for a car, and then you get the car, and you look at the car, and you go, man, I'm believing God for a car. And they go, well, why do you need to believe for a car? Don't you have a car? Isn't, it, isn't the car there? The car's there. Well, but I'm believing for a car. Well, you don't need to believe for a car because the car's there. You believe for what you can't see. Even though that it's not tangible, it's not visual. In fact, visual things are not good for your faith anyway. The children of Israel saw the Red Sea open. They walked right through the Red Sea. And they came through on the other end, and what did they start doing? They started crying and whining and complaining like little baby babies. I started to say something else, but I'm going to restrain myself. They started crying and complaining. Wouldn't you would have thought, man, you just saw a deliverance like nothing that has ever happened before? You'd have thought people have been saying, Glory to God, that's my God. If he can part the Red Sea, he'll feed me good. But you know what? Didn't last very long, did it? See, it's when you don't see. And you remember, I'm going to close with this. You remember what Rahab told the spies in Joshua chapter 2? They came in, and they was talking to Rahab, and Rahab says, basically, I'm paraphrasing, she basically said, where y'all been? She said, we heard how your God opened up the Red Sea. We heard how that you destroyed the kings of Sion and Og. We heard about this, watch this, and our hearts did melt and there was no courage left in any man because we heard that God was coming for us. He was coming for our land. They heard, but yet they were in faith that it was God's land. Watch this. The Israelites saw and they lost their faith because hearing makes you have to believe something. It gives you a choice. Do I believe it or do I have to see it? I submit to you, you don't have to see it. You don't want to see it. I mean, until it's come to pass from your belief. Then you don't need to believe for that anymore. I don't need to believe for salvation anymore. The Bible said, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God is raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I believe that. I said that. Boom. Done. I don't need to believe for salvation any longer. It is mine. I know I, I haven't experienced it yet, I'm, but I'm not sitting there going like, oh God, I hope, I hope someday in the sweet by and by I make it. In my heart of hearts, I know I'm going to heaven. Because I believe it. What else do you need in your life to come to pass, to change? Thomas was confronted eight days after his other disciples. How long does it take you? Let's not be slow learners. Let's be quick to believe God. Let's be quick that when we hear the Word of God preach, walk out of here today and go, I'm going to be a quick believer. When I hear it in the Word of God, I'm going to choose to believe even what my, my circumstances are not lining up with that. I'm, it isn't going to matter. I'm going to believe. I'm going to be a believer. I'm going to actually be qualified. I'm going to qualify what it is that I say that I am. Many times people will go through life and they'll say, 
well I'm a believer you meet somebody another Christian and you use that word interchangeably instead of using the word I'm a Christian you go I'm a believer how about just be a believer right 